Be honest with me. When did you learn about the female epicenter of last the clitoris? Or female ejaculation? In this episode, we take an historical look on how female sexuality was described, depicted, and analyzed, and why it took so long until female sexual pleasure re-entered the spotlight. And we'll start in ancient Greece. Platon already declared women as crazy due to a wandering womb. Hysteria, a later on quite frequently diagnosed mental illness for women, goes back to the word hystera, which is Greek for uterus. So apparently, having a uterus makes you mentally ill. Huh. Augustinus, a Roman bishop, had plenty of sex in his youth himself, but then changed his mind and preached that having sex is a sin and that our reproductive organs, specifically those of women, are the source of our incapability to control ourselves, like when Eve gave Adam the apple of sins. In voila, female genitals were considered a seduction to sin. From now on, women's carnal desire was depicted as insaturable. We are making a big leap, to be more precise, a thousand point of years forward. Previously, the appearance and functions of genitals of both sexes were rather equally researched and depicted. But from the 18th century on, female sexual organs were only measured and analyzed in contrast to... You guessed it! A man. And since those, I would like to call them pseudoscientists, were male, they came to the unsurprising conclusion that women were the sexually inferior incomplete version of man. Lovely. Simultaneously, woman's sexual desire was not prominently described anymore. In the Victorian era specifically, women were required to be in full control of their sexuality, which was in fact embraced by early feminists to emphasize which high morals and intelligence women had, because they were not distracted by sexual lust. Well, that's quite a shift from the insexual seductress, huh? Quick interruption, <laughs> definitely check out the marriage episodes as those topics are closely intertwined. Thanks and bye! Now, very specific women were called out as basically a whore, namely those who lived out their sexuality in an otherwise prude and highly regulated societal order. The sexually active woman was considered a very particular threat to otherwise well-behaved citizens and needed to be pointed out and prosecuted. Welcome to the origins of slut shaming. John Harvey Kellogg. Yep, the cornflakes inventor did not only do cereal, but was also a doctor who published books in which he claimed that masturbation was basically the reason for most illnesses in women. Excuse me, doctor, I have uterus cancer. Clearly, you masturbated too much. Doctor, sir, I am epileptic. Stop touching your clit, woman. Excuse me, sir, uh, why am I diagnosed with insanity? For fuck's sake, is no one listening to me? Stop touching your clitoris! Ah! Well, luckily, Mr. Kellogg found a remedy. He applied carbolic acid onto the clit. Well, I guess problem solved, right? But Mr. Kellogg was not the only one massacring the clitoris. Dr. Isaac Baker Brown became known for what was called radical clitoridectomy, a surgical removal of the clitoris, a procedure that was done on actually quite a few women. Luckily, in the 1860s, Dr. Brown was not allowed to practice anymore, but not because he conducted radical clitoridectomy on women without their consent, <laughs> but because he failed to ask for their husband's consent first. And by the way, the surgical removal of the clitoris did not end with Dr. Brown losing his license. It was widely practiced until the end of the 19th century, and in some states, even longer than that. In the US, the last documented radical clitoridectomy was conducted in 1949 on a five-year-old girl. I'm off. Bye. Anti-circumcision campaigns from the West towards other countries now seem quite hypocritical, don't they? Now, dear friends and followers, we're diving into psychoanalysis and their bloody absurd, excuse my language, ideas of female sexuality. Alfred Adler, an Austrian psychotherapist, coined the term sexual anesthesia. And the background story on how he came to this conclusion is quite bizarre. 
Adler conducted research on women's sexuality by inviting his female patients to his laboratory, where he witnessed that women were able to achieve orgasms through clitoral stimulation. And now comes the fun part. He tagulated them as frigid because, oh no, <laughs> they did not get through male penetration. Duh. And now we're coming to Sigmund Freud, such a simpatico fella. <laughs> he became known for diagnosing a multitude of women with female hysteria that led to their psychiatric lockdown. He described female sexuality as a mystery to humankind. Sigmund may be talking to women instead of, you know, writing about them with your superiority complex would actually help you understand. Well, uh, apparently that's too much to ask for. Sigmund Freud furthermore established the dichotomy that a girl's sexual arousal depends on the clitoris, while for sophisticated women it derives from the vagina or, bluntly said, heterosexual intercourse. Hence, a woman who was touching herself was underdeveloped and childish. Of course, the male penis was the holy grail and the only measure to bring pleasure. Well, unfortunately, Freud's theory was complete garbage and made women feel like failures. The dogma that pure penis and vagina penetration is going to automatically lead to a climax left women wondering what was wrong with their bodies. And the answer is absolutely fucking nothing. Let me give you a bit of sex ed real quick. Three, two, one. Ah! The inner side of the vagina has way less nerve endings than the clitoris. And the clitoris, with its legs and erectile tissue, actually resembles more the penis, just with this tiny fact that it has even more nerve endings. So, <clears throat> shall you rather say the penis resembles the clitoris? Huh? After 1900, the word clitoris was practically nowhere to be found in texts about human anatomy. The center of female pleasure became immensely unpopular. But hey, if you thought that pseudoscientific conclusions like Freud's were already misogynistic, let me introduce to you Jean-Paul Sartre's Adlerium complex, which described that female genitals were mainly a whole, and because of this perforation, women craves for it to be filled, because only then she's whole. Wow. Make me whole again. No, 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 said no woman ever. Sorry, that one. Mm, should I tell you how far this theory goes back? To ancient times. Literally. Claudius Galenus, a super influential doctor, stated that the vagina is a to eternity unborn penis. <laughs> Let's sum up. Firstly, women were depicted as overly sexual and in their seductiveness, the embodiment of sin. Then, they were required to be sexually abstinent and solely focused on male penetration and pleasure. They were diagnosed with mental illnesses, titled as being underdeveloped, and even have been mutilated if they did experience sexual pleasure through their clitoris. Historically, those factors ultimately led to an erasure of knowledge on female sexuality, and specifically the clit, by the male scientific circle. So, how do we make it from here to a movement for sexual liberation? Let me tell you a story. Dr. Mary Stowe was born in 1880, found herself in a section of obscene books in the British Museum when she tried to escape from a loveless, degrading, and uh, pretty much sexless marriage. While the suffragettes were marching towards Buckingham Palace in 1914, Mary left her husband and moved into a shared house with friends, where she begins a diary, and a very explicit one, to keep record of her menstrual cycle, but also of her self-experimentation, aka masturbation and orgasms. In 1918, she published her book Married Love, which received quite some backlash. <laughs> some call it a filthy handbook of prostitution, but it made her famous. And surprisingly, most feedback was actually positive, and about 40% of readers' letters were from men. Finally, timely aligned with the suffragette movement, women fought for their own reproductive rights and sexual liberation. In the 1990s, a study conducted by Masters and Johnson was celebrated as a sensation. And the sensational thing of the study was that clit stimulation plays a major role in female sexuality. <laughs> you don't say! Wow. However, the clitoris was still just meant for foreplay in order to, as you can imagine, get the fluence running for sexual intercourse. Or in other words, a means to ensure successful male penetration. Back at the old topic again. 
inspiration. Over 30 years later, Helen O'Connell came to the rescue. He discovered the actual size of the clitoris with its erectile tissue in 1998. But somehow, these scientific descriptions did not make it into most school books nowadays, in which the clitoris was wrongly depicted as a one centimeter organ. Let me know in the comments below whether this is also the case in your country. Even our sex ad is penis oriented. Freud, Adler and Mr. Kellogg would be so, so, so proud. <laughs> now it's your turn. <laughs> Do you think that we still learn about sex from a perspective that prioritizes male pleasure and in which penetration is the holy grail, which then also neglects completely other forms of sexuality? <laughs> Let me know in the comment section below. I hope I see you next week in the next episode. Until then, have a lovely day, stay kick-ass, and see you next time. Besitos!